Today is March 19th, 1865, and joining me from Turner's Lane Hospital in Philadelphia, my special guest is Major Paul Sanborn of the Union Army. He has taken time from his busy schedule to speak with us about the diseases causing the deaths and sicknesses of our soldiers. Major Sanborn, could you explain what the worst killing disease is among the fighting men? Well, Lane, let me, let me start off by saying that you have to understand what disease is, because all disease comes from the same source. Now, basically, and stop me if you don't understand this, uh, this is very detailed medical uh, explanation. There are four fluids in the body. There's the blood, the phlegm, the black bile, and the yellow bile. Those four fluids must remain harmoniously balanced in order for the person to maintain a happy countenance. If those four fluids become imbalanced, then the person experiences dis-ease. How do the fluids become imbalanced? Well, there are a number of possibilities. Basically, it's irritations. Irritations can come from the outside, for example, on the skin, or irritations can come internally through the liver, I mean through the lungs, or through the eye, or through the nose, or ear. Or you could eat something and take it in that way. These irritations attack the nerves in the body. And as the nerves are irritated by the irritations, they cause the muscles to spasm. Once the muscles start spasming, this produces that fluidic disharmony which causes the patient to suffer. So at any time, at any time, when irritations overwhelm the nervous system, the patient becomes diseased. Now, in the Army, what we see, we see the men are tired, they're worn, they've experienced campaigning, they've been marching, they're out in the rain, they don't get good food, and they're, they're tired. They, they lose their vital force. They very frequently suffer nervous prostration of their vital force. And this allows all types of dis-ease to afflict them. So uh, what we find is a lot of uh, flux uh, or the dysentery. And once the flux or the dysentery strikes, it's very difficult to stop it. That's why we encourage the men to wear flannel about their trunk. And as you can see, I myself have wrapped my trunk with flannel. Mm -hmm. This has an inordinately well hydrometric properties to it that help to maintain a fluidic harmony within the person and thus avoiding flux. Uh, if this doesn't work, then what we do is we give them uh, opium. Opium uh, in pill form pill. allows the patient to, uh, to sort of flow through the disease of the flux. If opium doesn't work, then of course we can use uh, calomel to completely purge the system, or we can try to uh, cork it. But basically beyond that, uh, flux carries off thousands of our men. It's caused by bad air, it's caused by bad food, it's caused by deep emotion, it's caused by cucumbers, uh, there are any number of causes of flux, but it's one of our most serious diseases. It's truly a very, very dangerous one. Uh, now, when a patient does come down with any number of diseases, let me tell you something about the treatments that we have. There are external treatments and there are internal treatments that we can use to counter the irritations that cause the disease. Uh, one of the externals, for example, Let's say, for example, you are experiencing another very common illness is the congestion of phlegm in the lungs. You have an imbalance of phlegm. Uh, what causes this? Well, sleeping with the windows open at night, one of the most serious afflictions uh, caused by night air. And what, uh, what happens is that patients will refuse to listen to medical advice and they will breathe in the night air. They'll go to sleep with their window open. And as they breathe in this night air, well, you see, to explain that to you, the, the sun in the sky exerts a very beneficent pressure on the surface of the earth. And while the sun is in the sky, 
all creatures are in harmonious balance. But when the sun re retires in the evening, as it tends to do, this removes the pressure from the surface of the earth. Once this pressure is removed from the surface of the earth, the noxious effluvia of the miasmic swamp vapors are thus allowed to flow along the surface of the earth at night. As these noxious effluvia move along the earth, they'll hit a building, go up the side, in through a window, down along the floor, and up onto the bed to strangle you. This is very serious. The noxious effluvia carry fomites inside the air. These fomites directly into the lungs, irritating the surface of the lungs, causing an imbalance of phlegm. That's why you should never sleep with the windows open at night. You die. First you turn yellow, high fever, and then you die. But once you have, in fact, inhaled the night vapors, what do you want me to do as a doctor? Well, there's a number of things. What we'll do is, once we have diagnosed this uh, affliction, we'll remove the shirt, and we'll take a cup, and we'll fill the cup, and we'll porcelain cup. We'll fill it with alcohol. Then you ignite the alcohol in the cup. And while it's flaming, you place this directly against the skin of the patient. This produces a very fine blister. And that blister, once the cup is removed, you take your lancet. I have one here somewhere. All you do is take the lancet. Now, in order to make sure that the patient is comfortable, you want to be sure that your lancet is sharp. So we strop it on the leather of our soles to make sure that it's sharp enough. And then once, and this is very sharp, this is razor sharp, uh, what you do is you take that and you lance the blister, thus removing that fluid. You see, it's the fluids in the body. See, and you brought the fluids up to the surface from the lungs, and you remove them now. And then, of course, if the patient shows no sign of improvement, then you take the cup, fill it again with alcohol, and replace it against the chest. Very few patients need that second application. Many of them show great signs of improvement just from that treatment alone. Does anybody die from this? Oh, no, no. Our patients tend to be very hardy, and they find it beneficial to receive that cupping. Uh, another possibility, if the cupping isn't particularly good, is that you can take the moxa, which is pieces of carded cotton cloth. You take the moxa, and you take a lucifer, you know, a lucifer, you strike it, and it flames up, and you light the moxa. And while it's burning slowly, you place it against the chest in the selected position that you have decided. And as the moxa cloth is burning against the chest, you take a small pair of bellows and you fan the moxa cloth so that the flame continues to burn, the cloth continues to burn, and it burns against the, the patient's skin. This, once again, provides that external stimulation to counter the irritations that have caused the disease in the first place. Now, you can also take a cautery iron and glow it red hot in a fire, and then place it in selected positions on the body. Oh, it's amazing what cures can come from the application of advanced medical treatment. Not only can you go externally then, but you can also go internally. And uh, just briefly, we use, uh, you can use uh, any number of ways to purge the system, to remove the irritations. Uh, one way is to purge it out one end, and then, of course, there's the way of purging it out the other end. Uh, calomel is the uh, emetic, I'm sorry, <laughs> calomel is the purge called the cathartic because it takes it out one end, and then tartar emetic brings it up out of the other end. Uh, what you do is you keep giving the patient tartar emetic until what comes up and out is clear. Then you know you've purged their system fairly thoroughly. With the calomel, you just have to be careful when you give them calomel that you don't give them too much. Because if you give them too much, you'll begin to notice that their tongue hangs out down their chin, and they begin to salivate a pint or more a day.
And not only that, but their teeth will become loosened in their gums, and the patients will be spitting out their teeth and putrid masses of their gum right along with it. And that's not good. That doesn't help as much as it should. So the calomel and the tartar emetic are two good sources for countering the internal irritations. There's also uh, quinine, which is the Jesuit bark, which is good. There's also epicac, the paragoric. We have any number of, of drugs, prescribed drugs, that we can give to the patient to help them in their affliction. Of course, there are a number of things that you should do to prevent the irritations from coming to you, first of all. Uh, for example, you see my beard. Very important. Uh, a beard is a sieve that helps to sift out the animoculae and thomatic particles that are in the air. And that's why we encourage the men to wear beards and not to shave, because the beard acts as a strain, removing these particles before they're inhaled. Uh, also, we encourage the men to encounter soap on a regular basis. We have found it to be a civilizing influence, and the soap helps to keep the men clean. So we encourage the men to bathe at least once a week, except in the wintertime or in the coolness of the, in the heat of the summer, when we encourage them to bathe at least once every two weeks. Also, we encourage the men to use the vaults, uh, to use the sinks properly. Uh, when their bowels move in an undisciplined fashion, uh, this causes miasmic baleful emanations which exude from the excretia. And these baleful emanations inhaled into the lungs can cause dis-ease. So the men are required to discipline their bowels. When they feel necessary to move, they move to the sinks. And of course, the only danger with that is that you want to be sure that you position yourself in the sinks properly so that you don't become part of the sinks. But otherwise, if you use the sinks properly, clean your clothing, clean yourself, wear a beard. These are things that can wrap your trunk with flannel. These are things that can be done to help avoid disease. Could um, you tell me um, what operation you specialize in? Well, at Turner's Lane right now, I'm, I'm actually assigned to the second core. And as you can see, uh, well, you can't see, but right here is my second core badge, which I'm very proud of. And uh, General Winfield Scott Hancock is our core commander. In the early part of the war, surgeons went off with each regiment, and they would handle the medical problems of each regiment. But uh, Jonathan Letterman and Joseph K. Barnes and Surgeon General Hammond, these are some of the men who have brought about changes and improvements in our medical corps since 1861. And what has happened is that instead of having a surgeon and an assistant with each regiment, they've taken all the surgeons and they've put them together and in core hospitals. So you see there's a core, then there's a division, then there's a brigade, then there's a regiment. So they've taken all the regiments in your core and they take all the doctors and put them together. Then what they've done, the better doctors are put in core hospital, which is where I am, and they're made surgeons. And a surgeon team is myself and my two assistant doctors and a person that delivers the steward, that delivers the chloroform. Then those doctors that are too freely given to drink or incompetent or quackish or just haven't proved themselves, they're sent out to what we call the advance, which is right behind the battle line. And they're the ones that first give attention to the wounded. Uh, so if you get shot, for example, uh, in the arm, the cert, you would come back to the, the doctor right behind your battle line, and he would rip off your uh, clothing, your shirt, to see the wound. And what he would probably do is take a sponge, much like this one here, which of course all doctors have to carry, but he would take a sponge out uh, in his bucket, and he would clean off the wound by putting the sponge in and, and dabbing off the wound. Then he would give you a drink of whiskey and an opium pill. Then he would look for the ball. He would stick his finger in to see if the ball's there and if it can, or any pieces of clothing or cloth. Then he would take morphine crystals. And the best way of applying this is to lick your finger and put it into the morphine crystal can, little can. Put it in and get the morphine stuck on the crystal, I mean on your finger, and then put it into the wound. Then you take lint 
or the moxa, that carded cotton cloth, and you pack the wound. Mm -hmm. Then you bandage it and send them back to us. Then we're the ones that have to perform the amputations if necessary, or do the other medical treatments necessary to the men. Now, right now, I'm at Turner's Lane, and it's on special duty. We're investigating, we're investigating the neurological problems. Some of our soldiers get too close to a cannonball. Cannonball will pass in the air, and they'll become shocked. And, and we're, mm -hmm. some men will take head wounds, and we're working with thyroidization and leech application along nerve lines to see if that can help to bring these men, to restore them to their proper sensibilities. So uh, when I'm down at the Second Corps in the Army of the Potomac in Virginia, uh, then we, you want to hear about some of those operations. Yes. Uh, well, it's, um, first of all, we don't cut at a moment's notice. Uh, that, that's their rumors. Uh, we try to save the man's arms or legs. Uh, mm -hmm. If they're caught, if they're shot in the trunk, or if they're shot in the chest or in the head, there's not much we can do for them. Our hospital will be like five, ten miles behind the lines. And of course, that may shift because the lines move. Yes. But by the time they get back to us, they're usually in shock, which is good. And they're placed in a yard outside the hospital, which is a house or a tavern or tents or whatever we can find. And <clears throat> as they're lying there in the yard, uh, the surgical team will come out, and we will examine each patient. Now, it's important for them to show patients. And that's why we call them patients, because they have to show patients until we get around to, to treating them. And there's not much yelling and screaming because by now they're in shock and they're mostly just moaning and lying there. And we'll examine each wound and decide what can be done. Now, as I said, if it's in the gut or in the chest or in the head, not much we can do. Sometimes we'll drill through the head with a trephine and then hold the patient on end and empty them, drain them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they get shot in the chest, we'll pack the wound because they suffer from dyspnea. In other words, they'll start breathing through the wound, and that excites everybody. So we'll pack the wound. And if they have a gut wound where their intestines are hanging out, we'll dust them and put them back in and sew them up. But really, there's not much we can do. It's the leg wounds and the arm wounds that we're concerned about. We can help there. Uh, what we do is, once we have located a patient with an arm or leg wound that looks like it has to be taken out, I mean, the, the wound has to be taken, I mean, the arm has to be taken off, uh, what we'll do is we'll identify them and bring them in. Then we'll chloroform them. And once they're chloroformed, uh, then we will uh, start the process. Now, this whole process takes longer to tell than it does to do it. It takes me about two and a half minutes to three minutes to do an amputation. Because you have to move fast. You don't want the patient out too long. So the first thing you do is you take the wound, uh, you, you look at the wound, you probe to see what this real story is. But assuming you're going to cut the arm, there's two ways of doing it. There's the flap and the circular, and I won't go into the details on that. But let's say, for example, you're going to do a flap wound. Well, let's, let's say a flap wound. What I would do is, of course, you'd have the arm, and you take a Catlin knife or any other large amputation knife, and of course it depends. I have two of them here, and you can see. And you just slice, and I don't want to do this to myself, but you just slice around. As your assistant holds the arm, you just slice around the wound uh, to cut off the skin. Then once the skin is cut off, you pull the skin back, exposing the muscle. Then you cut through the muscle. Once the muscle's cut through, then you take your, <clears throat> well, you can take any number of instruments, but the gnawing forceps here. You take the gnawing forceps and you cut and snip off the bone end so it's not jagged. You want it smoothed off. As a matter of fact, some surgeons will actually take the time and smooth it off with a file, a bone file. Then, once the bone has been cleared, you take the saw and you saw through the bone. You have to be very careful when you have completely sawed through the bone and the arm now has fallen away that you leave enough skin on the stump so that you can cover the stump with the skin. Very few men like to walk around with a bone hanging out of their stump. So you have to be sure that you've covered the bone with the, with the, stump, the stump with the skin. 
Then you have to uh, take your tenaculum, which is this instrument here, and you have to take each artery, each one, and you have to take time, at least a minute or so, to identify each of these arteries and grab it with the tenaculum. And then you take a, uh, a needle, I can grab one here without. I'll take the tenaculum and assist myself. Uh, you take a curved needle such as this, and you take oiled silk or boiled horsehair as your thread, and you just sew up the, well, you tie the arteries, and then you sew up your wound with these needles. I was getting ahead of myself. You grab the artery, you tie it with your ligature, then once you have all the arteries ligated, you take this and you sew up the entire wound. And you leave, be sure to leave, long enough strands coming out from the ligatures that after about six or seven days, they can be pulled and they should come free. So that, that's the basic type of operation. The patients are chloroformed, uh, then we bring them to, and they go to recover. How do you keep your instruments sterile? A what? Sterile. Clean. Clean? Um, oh, I, well, I wipe them off. <clears throat> See, now I'm being very polite today because I have on a clean coat here. But uh, I, I don't like mess and gore on my instruments, so I always wipe them off. And I carry a rag with me that I use to wipe them off with. So I, because you can't, you can't have gore hanging on them. You know, that's very messy. So I wipe them off. And every so often, there'll be a bucket of water. Sometimes we drink from it. Sometimes you wash the instruments from it. Sometimes you wash the patient. So, you know, that's how we keep them clean. And I'll wash, you know, I'll wash my hands uh, after a day or so of operations just to be sure that I'm clean. I don't like to have a mess on my own hands either. I see you, you have brought with you some of your surgical equipment. Could you explain how they're used and what they're used for? Oh, uh, surely, Lane, there's no problem with this. Um, I guess one of the most interesting uh, pieces of surgical <laughs> instrumentation that I have with me is this fleam. Uh, bleeding has gone out of vogue in the Army. We frankly don't have time to bleed, and so doctors have resorted to it less. As a matter of fact, I'll just basically treat people with uh, a ball of opium in my left pocket and a ball of blue mass in my right pocket. And along with the calomel and the tartar emetic and the quinine and so forth, we don't find much use in the bleeding anymore. But this is a multi-bladed fleam. That's a three-bladed fleam. Now, you know, somebody like you should not just bleed. You know that barbers are skilled in this. They used to be skilled in, in bleeding, and it takes a certain skill. For example, one, one danger is using the wrong fleam, using the wrong blade, too deep of a cut. It can be very harmful to your patient. Or bleeding from right to left, and you probably didn't even know that. But yeah. bleeding from right to left is extremely dangerous because you're trying to remove the impure blood. Somewhere in the body, there is a venous congestion. And this venous congestion has to be relieved, so you remove blood. Well, the venous congestion has fomatic and animoculitic properties to it. So if you were to bleed from, left, from right to left, you would draw these impurities and poisons through the heart. Die. Die. Uh, you don't want that to happen. So what you do is you always bleed from left to right. And the normal situation is that in a fleam situation, you take the patient's arm and you have them grab something. I don't know what I'd have here to grab. Well, usually grab a pole like this, make a fist, and you'll see the vein come right out on the arm. And then you take the selected fleam size for the amount of venous congestion that you're encountering. And you slice the vein and allow the blood to run down into your cup. You remove a pint of blood at a time. You remove one pint. If the patient improves, then it's not necessary to remove more. But you just keep removing pints of blood until finally something happens. Now, if you don't have a fleam, one other way of removing blood is by leech. 
You take the leeches, very hard to keep them alive in the army. You have to keep them, store them in warm beer. And then they become lethargic and you have to sort of kick them to wake them up. But they will, they will suck out the blood. And as I said to you earlier, we're using them in our neurological investigations by putting the leeches on the path of the nerves in the body. So, ble so bleeding is still done, but it's done less frequently than it used to be. And this is one way of bleeding. So that's one piece of equipment that I have with me. Uh, this is a tourniquet without the band. And the reason why it doesn't have a band is because the last band that I had in the tourniquet uh, became so clotted with blood and gore that I'm waiting for it to be laundered. And the tourniquets, we don't, I don't use the tourniquet as frequently as some doctors. I prefer my assistants to hold and to stop the, the blood that way, to hold the arm while I'm cutting. That way it's more effective than to use the tourniquet. Once you put a tourniquet on, if you leave it on too long, the patient can lose the entire limb, can cause severe clotting and difficulties. So tourniquets are very, very dangerous to use, especially with wounds. And uh, what I'm thinking of is like if you're out in the front and a patient comes to you and, of course, you're being overwhelmed with patients and you decide to put a tourniquet on their arm and send them back to us, it's very dangerous. The only time we would use a tourniquet like that is actually when we're operating and if I didn't have an assistant. But I find an assistant with stronger hands is better than the tourniquet here. I also have, uh, ah, I, I still have, uh, this is from my first patient. And this is, uh, I remember him by this. Uh, this is a very, this brings back a lot of funny stories. <laughs> ah, mistakes, you know, some you live with, some you can't. But I, I still have that with me to remind me of uh, my earlier days. Uh, what else do I have? I have my forceps here that you use to go in and, and grab arteries, veins, uh, or also to pick out, pull out materials. Uh, very, very uh, good at doing that, picking out pieces of cloth or whatever from the wounds. But I find it's better if you're going to probe. You don't probe with this. You, of course, probe with the finger. That makes the best probe, because then you can feel the ball in there. So this, this is the forceps here for that. And um, I think I already demonstrated these forceps. These are, these are gnawing forceps that you use to clip off the clip off the end of bones or whatever. And um, <clears throat> they have a number of fine uses. They also can take off toenails and fingernails. So either way, a number of fine uses for this. Then I have long pronged forceps like this to go in deep enough where the others don't go that long. You just stick this right into the wound and try to bring out the ball if your finger can't get it. You can use this piece of equipment. So there are some of the, uh, some of the things I already mentioned, the Lancet. There's some of the pieces of equipment that we have with us. Could um, you explain to me what role the women play in the war? <sighs> well, that, uh, there's been two major improvements in medical science during this war. One has been the ventilation theory. We never allowed our patients to have fresh air before the war, but now we're allowing them to have fresh air. We spray the air with, I mean, with bromine and chlorine and, and so forth to, to keep out the fomites and the animoculae, but we allow them to breathe the fresh air. Uh, another advance besides the ventilation theory has been the, uh, <clears throat> the role of women. Uh, women, by their nature, are more gentle than men. Up until now, we have mostly had men, stewards, with the army, handling the wounded and the sick. But now, in this war, we have allowed women to come in and render their tender mercies to our men. At first, it was rather rough, because the woman that was put in charge was a woman by the name of Dorothea Dix. And Dorothea Dix chose specifically the ugliest, most unattractive women that are on the face of this earth. Women who would wear no curls on their hair, no hoops, uh, no nothing uh, except the driest, most canvas-like substances around their bodies. Didn't matter because no one would care for their bodies anyway. 
But she would choose these type of ugly over 30 women, over 30 years of age, specifically because she felt that a younger, attractive woman, uh, like yourself, would uh, somehow stimulate the base natures of the patients. And so these women came in very officious, very discouraging. As a matter of fact, they were even better than tartar emetic. They had such a sterling effect on the men that I stopped giving them tartar emetic uh, because these women would produce the same effect. And what happened was these women would come in and try to take over. They would tell us not to operate, not to prescribe these medicines. They became very officious, as sometimes women do when they get a little bit of power and a little bit of authority. And so we had a rough period adjusting to these women. But now what we have found is that the women are very, very strong in their care for the sick. We have found the help of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which is, of course, a commission of both men and women, very helpful. They come in and write letters for the men, bring them fresh food, clean them, take care of them. And also the Sisters of Mercy, Sisters of St. Joseph, especially here in Philadelphia, uh, they're all called by the men, they're all called Sisters of Charity, no matter what their religious order name is. But the Sisters of Charity, especially in Philadelphia, very, very nice to the men. The men love them because these Sisters of Charity are, are not officious and they're not obnoxious. They're very friendly and very caring women. And they come into the hospitals, like at Satterley down here in Philadelphia and at Mauer mm -hmm. and at Turner's Lane and at the General Hospital at 3rd and Cherry. Uh, there are a number of fine people who come in and help. So the women do. Uh, of course, there are no women doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, we, that, that's not uh, a good idea because the female mind cannot handle the delicacies and intricacies of the medical profession. So we discourage women from even considering being doctors. Hmm. Kat, I know you have a busy schedule, and I would like to thank you for joining Quite us. Quite welcome. With men in the Union Army who are devoted to the work, like Major Sanborn, I'm sure this terrible war will come to a conclusion. <laughs>